On August 5, 1962, screen star Marilyn Monroe was found dead of barbiturate poisoning. Was it really a suicide, as her millions of fans were led to believe? We came to the conclusion that uh, it was unquestionably a murder. I very strongly believe that Marilyn's death was an accident. It was our opinion that this case should most accurately be certified as suicide, or probable suicide. I know, based upon my particular involvement in it, that there was a cover-up of some of the information uh, to the public. Marilyn Monroe did not commit suicide. She was politically assassinated. She was at the height of her career. She had everything to live for. Could this woman have taken her own life? Was it an accident? Or was Marilyn Monroe the victim of murder. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Who was this product of Hollywood? Raised in an orphanage and foster homes, Norma Jean Baker grew up in the Hollywood of the 30s, a fantasy land where anything could happen. Its glitter and magic filled the dreams of a troubled little girl who wanted desperately to be a part of it all. At 16, Norma Jean went off to the photographers and on to become Marilyn Monroe, one of America's biggest stars. Her life can be summed up in a series of headlines. The ultimate sex goddess. Adored by millions. Married to one of America's greatest athletes. Married to one of America's most gifted playwrights. Divorced from them both. The troubled little girl became a confused and often desolate woman. On August 5, 1962, Marilyn Monroe died of barbiturate poisoning. This product of Hollywood had become its victim. The story of her death has been carefully pieced together. The information about Marilyn Monroe came from personal friends, members of her household staff, and the first officer to arrive at the scene. Further information came from doctors, coroner's office personnel, and others who might give insight into the case. The purpose of this investigation is not to accuse, but to examine some of the inconsistencies that seem to exist. These inconsistencies become apparent when we examine the evening of her death. Mrs. Eunice Murray, Marilyn's housekeeper, states that Marilyn retired early, closing the door to her bedroom after receiving a phone call from a friend. Her spirits were high. She had made plans for the following day. In this recreation, Mrs. Murray explains what happened later that night. About midnight, I stepped out of my bedroom door and noticed immediately the telephone cord on the floor leading to Marilyn's room, and this was an alarm. There was a telephone that, started, that originated in another bedroom that Marilyn took to her room, but when she went to bed at night, she would take the telephone itself, the instrument, back into the room and cover it with pillows so she wouldn't hear it ring. She had that telephone cord went, was, went under her door, and that was an alarm signal the only one that I had. So I rushed to another telephone in the other bedroom and called the doctor. 
told him what I had observed. He said, try the door, which I did. And I went back and told him that I couldn't open the door, but I would rush outside and see if I could separate the curtains at the window. And I had to come back in the house and get a poker to separate the draperies. And I saw Marilyn lying with her face down. Almost immediately, it seemed to be, the doctors appeared. Dr. Greenson lived very near, within, what, less than two miles. And um, then Dr. Greenson tried the door, of course, then went outside and took the poker from my hand and broke the glass of the window that he could get into. One of the windows didn't have the iron grill and I ran around the house and into the house and stood at the door, waiting. And by the time he came to the door and opened it, he said, we've lost her. My name is Jack Clemens. On the night Merrill Moreau died, I was a sergeant on the Los Angeles Police Department. I was the watch commander of West LA Division. When I arrived at the house, Mrs. Murray, who was Marilyn's housekeeper, showed me in. I met her psychiatrist who had called me, Dr. Greenson. I was shown the scene, shown the body, and I was shown a table alongside the bed that contained a considerable number of bottles. I was shown one empty bottle that I was told had contained approximately 45 nebutol. I put out a call over the police radio for two more units to meet me at the scene, another sergeant to take charge of the scene, and a field unit to protect the scene because when the press, etc., began to arrive, this would be necessary. There were two uh, things at the scene that disturbed me. One was the time element between the discovery of the body and the call to the police station. As I was told, the housekeeper had discovered Marilyn's body at approximately 11.30 or midnight, but they had not phoned the police until about 4.30 a.m. Uh, I was told by Dr. Greenson that um, this was because they had checked with the publicity department at the studio. Uh, that didn't uh, make much sense. The other thing that would have obviously occurred had the situation been as it had represented to me was that there would have been vomit from her because you simply cannot swallow that much barbiturates without uh, throwing some of it up later on. It makes, uh, has a very violent reaction in the stomach. Experts throughout the country became intrigued with the case. Dr. Sidney Weinberg, coroner of Suffolk County, New York, questioned the finding of the suicide investigation team. People who uh, have died as a result of uh, excessive ingestion by mouth of barbiturates is that in their agonal stages as they're dying they throw up they have regurgitation and this regurgitated material uh, comes out onto the pillowcase or whatever they're resting on a member of the suicide investigation team was psychiatrist robert Littman. no it uh, people don't go through contortions. They seldom vomit. It depends how much water they need to take down the pills. The absence of agreement between expert opinions and the facts he observed led Jack Clemens to begin an investigation of his own. Sort of an unofficial investigation, you might say. In association with several civilians, no one on the police department was involved in this uh, except myself. We came to the conclusion that uh, it was unquestionably a murder, the reason being quite simply the fact that the coroner's report did not show a trace of barbiturates any place in her digestive tract. At the uh, autopsy, her stomach was empty. What that means is that a considerable period of time, several hours, had elapsed between the time she ingested the fatal 
pills and the time she died. But that is quite common. Now, this is uh, the perplexing thing. It, it's inconceivable that a person could take that amount of pentobarbital by mouth and not have any trace of it chemically in the stomach. There would have been some residue in the digestive tract, and there was none. Therefore, she could only have gotten it through another method. Specifically, there are two ways she could have gotten it. One was a hypodermic needle. The other was a suppository. Uh, there is a very high rate of absorption from a suppository. She had a lethal dose in her blood that she did not swallow. Therefore, it had to be given to her by somebody else. That person she had to know and she had to trust. Now, if the death was caused by injection, then, and she did it herself, then where is the syringe? It was not present at the scene. And if she didn't do it, then someone else had to do it. So I do not hesitate at all to call this what it simply is. It is a murder, and I do not hesitate at all to further go and say that a conspiracy existed between the police department, between the coroner's office, and between the L.A. County District Attorney's Office to conceal this murder and pass it off as a suicide. My name is Lionel Grandison, and I was a deputy's coroner's aide at the time of Marilyn Monroe's death. I believe that there was a cover-up of Marilyn Monroe's death. Uh, it's not really clear to me if uh, she was murdered or if, in fact, it was suicide. But I know, based upon my particular involvement in it, that there was a cover-up of some of the information uh, to the public. Um, and I signed her death certificate. The person who, assign who signs the death certificate is their responsibility to look through the file, be sure that all the information there pertaining to the death is in the file, and that um, if it's not, you go and seek it out. Uh, but supposedly, when it gets to that desk, that all the information is there. But in Marilyn's case, it was not there. So, uh, looking to do my job again, uh, I went through the various the suicide team's report, the medical examiner's report, the toxicologist's report, all the various reports that are supposed to be a part of a folder. Okay, I went to seek them out. And everywhere I went, I found that there was no information on it. Why should I sign the death certificate without the information? But when I went to Dr. Curfee uh, to ask him about this file, he told me that it was not my responsibility to ask questions about it, to sign the death certificate. We made our report to Dr. Theodore Curfee, who was the medical examiner at that time. Immediately upon receiving our report, he did call a press conference, and we announced our findings to the press. No one in the office ever saw this report from the suicide team. Uh, at the time when Dr. Curfee told me to assigned a death certificate, that was one of the specific questions I asked him. What about the report from the suicide team, okay? He said that we were covered by the fact that we stated probable suicide, okay? And that he had a, both an oral and a written report from the suicide team that would come into the report at a later date. Some experts feel the conclusion of probable suicide should be questioned. I'm not saying that Marilyn Monroe was murdered, but I offer the possibility, in view of the evidence, that that possibility does exist. And unless uh, further information can be supplied, the findings of a complete investigation, uh, until I would see those personally, I, I'm very unsatisfied with the certification. I believe that Marilyn did not commit suicide purposely. I think it was an accident. It's the only reasonable, logical conclusion that I would have. And I have good reason to believe that. Because she had told me that if ever uh, there came a time when I knew that she had taken some sedation, I should watch very carefully unless she went to sleep, that she wouldn't take another dose of sedation. Her own housekeeper cannot accept the suicide charge, but thinks it was an accident. Psychiatrist Robert Littman reports on the findings of the psychological autopsy. Our main problem in this case was to distinguish between suicide and accident. It is quite possible 
for someone who is chronically or habitually using large amounts of sleeping pills. And Miss Monroe had a chronic difficult sleep problem. For such people sometimes will overdose accidentally without deliberately meaning to take the overdose. When people do that, usually there are signs of disarray and confusion in the room because they've been toxic, intoxicated. And uh, there are um, often pills scattered around because they've lost track of them. And usually there still are pills left on the scene because people who are abusing drugs, using large amounts, the thing they dread most is to run out. So they always maintain a supply. We think of suicide then when we have someone who uh, has made special provision to get extra pills, which was true in this case, and someone who uh, has used up all their pills, which was uh, true in this case. Suicide, accident, or was Marilyn Monroe, as some believe, the victim of murder? A tale of intrigue has been suggested. A tale woven around not only the inconsistencies in the case, but around wiretaps, blackmail, and the alleged existence of the mysterious diary of Marilyn Monroe. Milo Spiriglio, a private investigator with the Nick Harris Detective Agency. In 1975, a noted investigative reporter by the name of Al Stump brought to us a gentleman by the name of Bob Slatzer, an investigative reporter and an author. He had an incredible story to tell us. He believed that Marilyn Monroe was murdered and did not commit suicide. It's not very often we would investigate a client, but in this particular case, we found it necessary. Mr. Slater's story was so incredible about the death of Marilyn Monroe, the possibility of a homicide, the probability of a famous person or persons involved. We checked Mr. Slater's story out. At that point, we were convinced Mr. Slater had a story to tell, and we had an investigation to do. Hollywood writer-producer Robert Slatzer wrote a book on the death of Marilyn Monroe. Shortly before Marilyn was found dead, possibly a little bit over two weeks before, she had called me quite alarmed one afternoon and asked me if I could pick her up and uh, drive out to the beach north of Malibu. There were some things she wanted to show me and tell me about, which included the diary. The entries in her diary are quite interesting and involve national security, which startled me, quite frankly. Lionel Grandison saw Marilyn's personal effects in the county coroner's office. I had an occasion to look through the diary again, looking, and it had some, some pretty uh, bizarre information in there that no one had spoke about at that time. But I do know, all right, that these notations were in that book, and I know that that book only lasted around the coroner's office for about one day. I was especially concerned with Marilyn keeping that diary, and um, I asked her, if she didn't think, if I, I mean, I told her I thought it was a piece of dynamite she was carrying around with her, quite frankly. And uh, she said, well, don't worry about it, because she said, I carry it in my purse during the daytime when I'm away and so forth. When I'm home, it's in my file cabinet. Um, somebody else must have gotten this information, too, because uh, her file cabinet had been broken into on two different occasions within 10 days before she was found dead. And uh, it happened to be that many mysterious things began to happen about this time and including uh, her fear of the telephone lines being tapped which were eventually proven. Marilyn Monroe always had a fear that her phones were tapped. Little did she know that her rooms were also bugged. And Marilyn Monroe had very good cause to believe that her phones were tapped because of her involvement with some political people. In 1977 on the old Marilyn Monroe house there was a leak on the roof and they called in a repairman to repair it. This particular gentleman worked with the Signal Corps of the United States government prior to his construction type of business and was very well familiar with, the, with wire taps and uh, room bugs. And he discovered a tremendous amount of wire inside the house. Now this is not common household wire. The type of wire he found was what's known as direct room bugs, which is capable of keeping the entire house bugged for any length of time. And it was believed that the wires were in the house way back in the 1960s. Spiriglio told us that an article to this effect appeared in a newspaper, but we were unable to substantiate this claim. After her mysterious death, 
the Attorney General of the United States ordered a raid on the house of a person by the name of Bernard Spender. He was a noted uh, wiretapper working directly for Jimmy Hoffa. The raid took 12 hours, and to our knowledge, it's the only raid that was ever bugged. The first five and a half hours of it was taped by the wiretapper, unbeknownst to the United States government. In those tapes, they found, according to very reliable sources, the tapes of the actual murder of Marilyn Monroe. It was on sound. The rooms were bugged, as well as the telephones. The New York Times reported that a raid was made on the home of Bernard Spindell, he claimed that the tapes of Marilyn Monroe's murder were among tapes confiscated in that raid. After Spindell was arrested for electronic eavesdropping, he died in prison, eliminating any possibility of substantiating his claim. In the controversy surrounding Marilyn Monroe's death, both sides have made statements that remain unsupportable. Our investigation attempted to separate fact from rumored innuendo. But questions still remain. Why did so many hours elapse between the discovery of her body and the arrival of the police? Question, did someone take the intimate details of Marilyn Monroe's private life? Question, if a diary did exist, where is it now? Will we ever know what really happened on the night of August 5th, 1962? Once upon a time, in the magic land of Hollywood, a troubled little girl dreamt of fame and stardom. Her dream came true. Marilyn Monroe was at the height of her career when her Hollywood fantasy ended in tragedy. A tragedy shrouded in mystery.